Well, comrades, I think it was Lenin who paraphrased uh, a letter by Marx to Engels in which he said that there are decades that pass as though they were only days, uh, but there are also days in which the experience, uh, the lessons of decades is condensed. And I think we can clearly see from what Fiona just alluded to there that we are living through a period, an epoch like the latter. Think, just think. I mean, you don't even have to think. You can, it's, it's, it's basically the last month you know, of, of explosive events. Think of what's happened. You've had the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. You've had the dropout of uh, Joe Biden from the US elections. You've had the French elections and the surprise victory of the, uh, the new popular front. You've had the mass movements in, in Kenya and now Nigeria as well. The even bigger movements in Bangladesh with the overthrow of the hated Hazina regime. And now, of course, these far-right riots and counter-protests, importantly, in Britain. And all of that taking place against the backdrop of increasing conflict, escalating conflict in the Middle East, and of course, the ongoing war in Ukraine. All of these events are really symptomatic of the period we're living through, which we've said repeatedly in our documents, in our lead-offs, is a period of sharp turns and sudden changes. That's, that's what we're seeing concretely playing out in Britain and internationally over the last month. It's a period uh, you know, of, of instability, of turbulence, reflecting the impasse and the decay of the capitalist system. And all of this is leading to instability at every level, whether it's economically, uh, environmentally, militarily, pol politically, and of course, socially. I mean, just think also to the last week in terms of the world economy, something that we haven't actually paid that much attention to in our, our lead-offs and articles that recently, but now suddenly you've had this roller coaster ride on the stock market over the last week. And why? Because of fears uh, that the US economy, the, the, the main uh, kind of driving force keeping the global economy afloat over the last couple of years, fears that that's now entering into recession and potentially going to drag then the whole world economy into recession as well, highlights really the deep crisis, the deepening crisis of uh, capitalism globally. Inflation has come down thanks to the, the high interest rates. But, uh, you know, only, uh, only at the, the expense, if you like, of potentially causing what they call a hard, land, a hard landing in the, uh, the economic jargon. Um, in other words, uh, uh, provoking a recession. And all the while, you've got these eye-watering debts building up uh, at every level for governments, for businesses, for households. And what we've got to understand with these debts is it really limits the, the room for maneuver for the ruling class. It limits what they can do come this next uh, slump, which is uh, clearly coming. What have you seen over the last few years, over the last decade and a half? Repeated bailouts every time capitalism goes into crisis. Bailouts of the banks, of big business, bailouts of the whole system in essence. But with all these debts now, that is, uh, is increasingly ruled out as a, as a further uh, option next, come the next slump. So the only avenue for the ruling class in, in come the next month will be more and more attacks, more austerity, more cuts, uh, and, and putting more and more this, uh, these pressures onto the working class, as they have done already over the last uh, 15 or 16 years. And we've seen this in Kenya. This is what the movement in Kenya represents. It was IMF-imposed austerity to try and uh, cut down the debts that have been built up in this uh, country dominated by imperialism. Same thing played out in Sri Lanka just a few years ago, where you saw similar scenes to that that have played out in, uh, in Bangladesh over the last week with the, the presidential palace stormed uh, and a mass movement. Why? Again, because the ruling class, they're trying to put all the burden for this crisis of capitalism, the, the debts, the inflation onto the working class. But we've got to point out, I think, uh, that yeah, these, these events taking place in Kenya, in Sri Lanka, now in Bangladesh, they're not just consigned to the, uh, to the, to the kind of countries dominated by imperialism, but to the ex-colonial countries. What's playing out in these countries is a mirror to the future that we will see in all countries across the world, including the advanced capitalist countries. Because in the USA, for example, the belly of the beast 
You've got enormous debts there, 35 trillion and counting in debts. The biggest imperialist power in the world also has with it this biggest uh, debt pile. And there's fears that that will grow and accelerate even further with a Trump presidency. And that is going to place uh, the, the whole position of, of, the, of US capitalism and the dollar in particular, uh, which, is, which is really underpins the whole global financial system. That position of the dollar is going to be increasingly put into doubt because if you've got all this uh, money being pumped into the system in terms of dollars, it's fictitious capital, as Marx called it. And increasingly, there will be uh, distrust over whether these dollars are actually worth anything. And that places further uncertainty on top of instability. And all of that is taking place uh, on top of further tensions and uh, growing fears around trade, around the, the question of rising protectionism and economic nationalism, particularly the trade war between the US and China, which is only going to intensify with a crisis of capitalism in the US and with the ongoing crisis of capitalism in China. Again, we haven't paid that much attention to China recently, but what's going on there in terms of the, the property bubble and the attacks on the working class, it's all creating an explosive situation. And it's really highlighting all the contradictions of capitalism globally. What's playing out in China is an accelerated version, if you like, of all the, the process that's taken place in, across the world. You know, the building up of debts, the, the stimulus, the government stimulus to try and bail out the system, this huge bubble that's ready to burst, the overproduction that that's causing now on a global scale, adding to on a global scale, and then causing then more tension between the different nation states. You're really seeing here the limits of capitalism globally, the, the question of the barrier of private property and the barrier of the nation state. And as world markets shrink, you're going to have more competition between the big powers and the multinationals. And already you're seeing that with uh, the US's policy to try and uh, what they call friendshore and reshore. In other words, trying to balkanize the whole global economy, trying to break up and reverse globalization, actually, uh, in order to protect the profits of the individual uh, nation states, the, the, country, the multinationals of the US being protected by Washington, the multinationals of China being protected by Beijing. And all of that's going to lead to a breakup of the world market and a, and a reverse of globalization, which has actually been what has actually kept a lid on inflation, what's fueled uh, what little economic growth there has been over the last 30 years. It's because of the expansion of world trade. And now all of that threatens to go into reverse. And this competition then over the loot, if you like, uh, between these different gangsters, these different pirates, that's going to fuel further geopolitical instability, which we'll talk more about in tomorrow, oh, I think it's Saturday's uh, plenary on, on British imperialism, what you're going to see is these ongoing wars and escalating conflicts getting more, uh, uh, more fierce, if you like, amplified also by another process that we've highlighted, the relative decline of US imperialism, which is kind of, if you like, as American imperialism finds itself overstretched, more and more these other rising powers are looking to carve out uh, you know, space for themselves, trying to grab a bit of the spheres of influence of the markets that are being left behind. You saw the embarrassing, humiliating defeat of US imperialism in Afghanistan, which was actually what pushed America then to, to, to try and uh, assert itself in Ukraine more and more, and has provoked that conflict there, trying to maintain that sphere of influence uh, in, uh, in, and expand its sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. And, uh, and therefore, yeah, you're seeing the escalation of uh, these crises in the Middle East, in Ukraine, but also the so-called small, if you like, wars, which I, I say small in inverted commas, but they're not big world wars, if you like, but these proxy wars playing out across the world, which are even, you know, equally as destructive for these places, tearing, you know, whole countries in Africa and Asia apart, in Sudan, in Ethiopia, in the Congo, in uh, places like Myanmar, these fierce proxy and small wars that, 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 you know, where the imperialist powers are battling out through their, uh, through their proxies are all stoked and intensified by these imperialist rivalries between the big powers, between the US, Russia, China, and France. And these, alongside, obviously, the, the imperialist plunder of these places, along with the climate crisis that's uh, getting worse and worse, that is then fueling the migrant crisis and, and forcing millions 
to flee their homes uh, every year. Now, the other side of all of that increasing imperialist rivalry is, of course, the rampant militarism that we see internationally, again, which we'll talk about in fur further in other sessions. But what you're seeing, in essence, is a new arms race opening up uh, to expand, to modernize, to re-equip uh, armies uh, in, in the face of this increasing imperialist uh, tension and rivalry. In the USA, trillions, billions uh, across the world, in, in Europe and China, now being spent on, uh, on, on these uh, weapons of destruction, uh, these means of destruction, dedicating increasing economic resources and productive capacity, not to social needs, but as I say, to means of destruction. And we have to highlight what this represents, this enormous waste and squandering that goes hand in hand with capitalism and imperialists. Uh, and imperialism. The imperialist warmongers, as we said in our, our material, in, in our election campaign, always finding the money for warfare, but never for healthcare and welfare, always finding the money for bombs, but never for books, for schools, for hospitals. This, I think we have to highlight, this is the international perspective, the world uh, context to what's taking place in Britain. This is what we have to understand. This economic, political, and historical context we have to digest it if we're going to make sense of what's happening here. It's impossible to really understand any of this turmoil, whether it's here at home or abroad, unless we fully really grasp the, uh, the global and historic significance of this systemic crisis. And what we're seeing, if you like, is all these uh, seemingly accidental or chaotic events. But we've got to understand, if you like, the necessity, the, the objective pressures and forces playing out behind our backs, behind the, that are forcing all of these events in, this, uh, in these directions and are, and are responsible for all these crises erupting at every level. Because if you were a superficial uh, observer, an empiricist, looking at events, for example, in Britain, looking at these kind of shocking scenes that have taken place over the last couple of weeks, you might just think that Britain's been seized by some sort of collective madness. And in fact, this is what the bourgeois say, that it's all the, the, the effect of, of online agitators. That's, that's all it is. It might as well have happened at any point. Uh, you know, it's just being stirred up by people like Tommy Robinson and co. But really, we understand that these riots are, are a damning indictment on the state of British capitalism and of the rotten ruling class that presides over it. These are, are, are symptoms, if you like, of a, si of a sick system. Uh, as we said in our material. Uh, you've got widespread violence and uh, far-right uh, looting. You've got, uh, before that as well, the riots taking place in response to police brutality and, uh, and in Leeds, and the police brutality as well, uh, leading to mass protests in Manchester. These are hardly a reflection of a, of a healthy society. Such events are, are not supposed to happen in so-called normal times. But this is the point. We don't live in normal times. Or if you like, we do live in normal times, but in a new normal, uh, a new normal of, uh, of, of, of you know, crisis and decline, uh, of endless scandals and sleaze, of all accumulated anger against the establishment that's just looking for some sort of catalyst or lightning rod, and of intensified class struggles and social explosions. That's the new normality for capitalism in Britain and globally, that's what we've got to get our heads around, that the events over the last month are no longer the exception. They're the new normal. They're the rule, if you like, going forwards and will only intensify. Everything taking place in recent weeks is really the culmination of processes and pressures that have been building up beneath the surface for years, if not decades. This is really the consequence of all of the ruling class's reckless actions over that period. You've had the long-term decline, the historic long-term decline of British capitalism with its turn away from industry towards financial speculation, uh, leading to, uh, to the closure of industries and, uh, and to the jobs massacres, the ghost towns being created across the UK, and obviously Port Talbot, which, uh, where we've uh, intervened uh, and tried to raise a, a bold militant uh, strategy and program. Port Talbot is really the latest tragic example of this process. And there'll be many more Port Talbots, if you like, in the years uh, ahead. 
All of these are, uh, if you like, the left behind places which, which rebelled against this broken status quo with the, the Brexit vote. And now we're also seeing, yeah, this discontent flaring up, whether it's in Hare Hills in Leeds or, uh, or with these riots in, uh, in many other towns and cities across the country over the last couple of years, a uh, couple of weeks, sorry. And all of this, of course, has been exacerbated, all this long term decline of British capitalism, exacerbated by the last 14 years of Tory austerity and attacks in response to the big, huge, historic capitalist crisis slump of 2008. All of this austerity has gutted communities and councils. It's led to real drops in, uh, in income, in living standards, not just for public sector workers, but for the whole working class. It's led to increases in homelessness and poverty, particularly uh, in terms of children. It's left schools, hospitals, utilities, infrastructure literally crumbling to pieces. And now you've got the, the scandal of actual shit being pumped into our waterways, not to mention, of course, all the actual crap or the metaphorical crap, if you like, that emanates from Westminster in terms of all of the, the cant, as, uh, as Trotsky called it, the hypocrisy, the scandals, the abuse that emanates from, uh, from Parliament and, our, and these MPs. But to distract from all of this, of course, you get the entire establishment then whipping up endless culture wars over migration, over LGBT rights, over environmental questions, constantly whipping up hatred against Muslims, against migrants, against trans people, and many more. And now we're seeing the deadly consequences of this playing out, the deadly consequences of the Tory and establishment culture wars. The decline of British capitalism, we should say, in this respect, finds its reflection also in terms of the degeneration inside the Tory party. The Tory party was once considered to be the most successful bourgeois party in the whole of Europe, if not the whole of the world. Uh, but now it's really become a laughingstock. It's like a Mad Hatter's tea party, if you like. And not only because of uh, Liz, I was outlasted by a lettuce truss, uh, who famously managed to tank both the British economy and the Tory polling figures you know, synchronously in the space of about 49 days, but also obviously her pre predecessor, the uh, Boris the myopic. Um, and uh, the point is that after years of crisis, the capitalists thought, uh, all, after years of all this chaos, the, the capitalists thought they had regained control over their party, their primary political representatives, by getting their man, their golden boy, city poster boy, Rishi Sunak, into Downing Street, imposing him upon the uh, Tory members and upon the country. But what have we seen? The, the, the sleaze and the scandal, it kept on coming. The backbench mutiny was never uh, really quietened. And the, uh, the hatred towards the Tories never subsided, and hence, why we saw this absolute battering of the Tories in the, uh, in the recent election with them losing hemorrhaging votes actually in all directions, particularly to, the, uh, to the, 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 the none of the above camp, if you like, the abstentions. And this highlights really this crisis in the Tory party that we've seen with successive leaders uh, being uh, shown to be completely incompetent and unable to get a grip on the situation. All of it highlights really that the problem was never down to actually this or that individual leader. It was never down to the supposed skill or otherwise of, uh, of, of uh, whether it was Theresa May or Boris Johnson or Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak. We quoted this ancient saying that who the gods wish to destroy, they first make mad. Now we've got to ask ourselves with the Tory leadership candidate, which next, you know, who's next, who, which is the next deluded crank that you're gonna get at the head of the Tory party? But the point is, it doesn't matter because whoever they put in there, uh, you know, and whoever's in Downing Street, they're going to be presiding over a decaying, dying system and will therefore necessarily seem ill-fated and cat-handed. Trotsky pointed this out in a very, uh, very uh, astute uh, analysis of the Russian Revolution in his history of the Russian Revolution. Had a whole chapter on the the decline and the the fall of the uh, Tsarist uh, monarchy pointing out that it looked very similar actually to the, 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 the decrepit uh, Ancien Regime in France and also to Charles I in, uh, in England. All of these seem to be completely ill-fated and uh, haphazard, 
Why? Because they all represent uh, and, and preside over a dying, decaying system. And therefore, you know, they're swimming against the tide of history, if you like. Nothing you can do in that situation will be correct because the whole forces of history are against you. And that's the same with any politician who tries to preside over British uh, capitalism and world capitalism in this epoch. And that means we can now look, enter Keir Starmer onto the stage, or Kid Starver, as he's been aptly named, the establishment's knight in shining armor. This is the man who was supposed to restore order and stability for British capitalism. And alongside his trusty banker sidekick, Rachel Reeves, he was going to ensure growth, growth, i.e. profits for big business. And it's ironic, actually, that while you've had fires raging across the country over the last uh, week or so, Rachel Reeves has actually been in Wall Street hobnobbing with billionaires and bankers, trying to convince them that Britain is a reliable investment opportunity for them to put their money in, thanks to her business-friendly government. But obviously, all of those hopes have now turned to dust. And I think we should underline this point, because we said in our perspectives that we passed at uh, our recent Congress just a few months ago, and in all of our editorials in, in, since then and, uh, and around the election, we've repeatedly stated that there would be no honeymoon period for this Starmer government. This supposed landslide majority would quickly be seen to be what it is, this sandcastle that could crumble very quickly. And I quote from our, our most recent editorial in the paper, before, written before all of these events over the last week or so, we said that this would be a government of crisis from day one. And how, how clearly do those words ring true on the basis of recent events? Just one month since Starmer gained the keys to number 10. Think of what's happened in that period. The attacks uh, on, uh, on, on, uh, around uh, child benefit, uh, the child benefit cap and the suspension uh, of seven uh, left Labour MPs. You've had the, uh, his Welsh counterpart, actually, uh, Vaughan Gething, having to stand down in disgrace over scandal and sleaze there. You've had the Chancellor announcing £22 billion black hole in the public finances, meaning further cuts and austerity to come, more attacks on the working class. All of this has happened in the last month, just on the political front. And that's not to mention on the streets, the police violence that you've seen provoking this response in Manchester we talked about, the draconian sentences handed out against the uh, Just a Poil Five for the environmental activists, uh, activism. Internationally, you've had Starmer going to NATO summit and hosting this uh, other European summit in uh, Blenheim Palace, prostrating himself in front of the Western imperialists and promising billions in bloodshed while refusing to remove this Dickensian two-child benefit cap. And now the worst racist violence and civil disorder in a generation, followed by this huge mobilization that we saw in response last night, all of that erupting and spreading across the country. All of that's happened in the last month, showing what a government of crisis this already is, uh, let alone thinking about what's to come with all of the deepening crisis of capitalism in Britain and internationally. Now, with the riots, obviously, you had Starmer promising swift justice, promising to restore order. And, uh, and we should say also, just in response to last night's uh, protest, you've had cynically, disgustingly, Starmer and the police, the, the head of the, the police, uh, Mark Rowley, and all the bourgeois press, you know, all these people coming out claiming this is their victory. So talking about, oh, what a magnificent show of unity that has helped restore order. Of course, they want order restored, as I say, for big business, the order to, to, to bring back the status quo of exploitation and oppression that working class people face day in, day out. And yeah, what, what they, they say, it's thanks to the, the, the police on the streets, the more police, the faster convictions, the tougher sentencing. They're saying that is the solution to, to the far right. We say no, that is not going to stop the far right. It's not what stopped them last night. And it's not what's going to eradicate that threat uh, for, for working class communities in the future. And not only we should add because the British state is actually itself crumbling apart. Courts are backlogged. The prisons are overflowing. The, the British state itself can't even uh, deliver the swift justice that it, it claims. But the point is we can have no trust in Starmer and police. 
The success, the success that we saw yesterday in driving the racists and the fascists off the streets of Britain, that did not come thanks to Starmer and the police. It came despite them. That's the clear point that we have to make. Because why? Because the police, we have written consistently in our current paper and, uh, and throughout, have we said they are what? They are the armed bodies of men in defense of capitalism, in defense of private property. Their role is to defend the ruling class and the status quo, not Muslim communities, not working class communities. In fact, as I say, just a week before, you had the stomping of a Muslim man's head into the ground in, uh, in, uh, in Manchester airport by this very same police that now claiming that they're here to protect Muslim communities. And, uh, and in fact, yesterday, where the police were present, where the fascists were present, it was the police protecting the fascists, not protecting working class communities. The police also were the ones murdering Mark Duggan in 2011, this uh, black man in Tottenham who's murdered. That sparked the, uh, the youth riots in London and elsewhere that we saw over a decade ago. And you know who was in charge of convicting those people who came out to protest against police brutality? Anyone know? Keir Starmer. Starmer, yes, there we go. Kid Starver was in charge of uh, helping arrest a thousand people who came to protest against the brutality, the repression of the state. These are what, this is why we have, can have no trust in Starmer and the police and why we have to say this is not your victory. This is the victory of working class people, of young people mobilizing in their thousands in cities across the country. We have to highlight it's Starmer himself who's been whipping up racism along with the rest of the establishment, pledging to stop the boats in his election campaign, pledging to deport Bangladeshis in his election campaign, where at a meeting hosted by the son of all papers, the scum, as it's rightly called in uh, Merseyside and elsewhere. This is the man who's committed, as I say, to further Tory austerity, who wants to continue the Tory austerity agenda, which is precisely what has fueled all of this explosive anger that we've seen over the last month in society. It's the whole establishment, including Starmer, who are to blame. This is the point we have to get across on our interventions on this demo. And when we're talking to people on the streets who want to fight racism, who want to fight fascism, they have the ones who have sown the wind and now they are reaping the whirlwind, right? And you do not invite the arsonists to come and try and put out the fire that they have created. That's what's going on here. And we shouldn't let them try and claim victory. And I think ordinary people understand this, okay? Muslim communities, Asian communities clearly understand that. And that's why the, over the last week, we've seen those same communities taking matters into their own hands, starting to organize grassroots, self-defense, self-organization. And what have you seen in response before yesterday's events? All these same people who are talking about unity now, talking about what a victory it is, that you've seen this mass mobilization that's kept the, the you know, what a great thing that is. All these same people just days before were saying, oh my God, these Muslim uh, self-defense groups, they represent aggression. And in fact, there's intimidation on both sides, trying to equivocate, trying to compare Muslim communities self-organizing defense to protect their shops, to protect their, their homes, to protect uh, themselves, their lives. This, they equivocate that with, uh, to equi equate that with the violence of these, uh, these far-right thugs and hooligans, that is completely cynical and scandalous. At the extreme end, you've of course had Farage, the Tories, and even Labour MPs excusing those fascist gangs, actually, trying to say they're just pro-Britain marches with legitimate concerns around migration and so forth. And then you've had on the other side, we should also point out, the religious leaders in these communities, the trade union leaders as well, the conservative trade union leaders, and even some of the anti-racist campaigners. We've had reports, we've heard from comrades at these uh, demonstrations where Muslim and Asian youth have turned up to organize, to protect themselves, to protect their communities. Criticism from so-called anti-racist organizers saying, oh, you've got to be moderate, you've got to calm, you know, there needs to be calm, show, show restraint and so forth. This is uh, completely scandalous. Why? Because calls for moderation and restraint in this context are an invitation to far-right gangs to carry on their marauding, to carry on their looting, to carry on what is frankly terrorism. And yet, yeah, let's call a spade a spade here. These were pogroms that we saw in Britain over the last week. 
and they were targeting what? Mosques, asylum seekers. Those people doing that targeting, they cannot be reasoned with. These are not people who uh, you need to have a nice conversation with over a cup of tea to try and convince them uh, of uh, you know, having hope, not hate, and love and unity and so forth, as you get from a lot of these, uh, these supposed left-wingers. These people are fascist thugs, and they need to be confronted head on, as we saw yesterday. In the words of uh, Trotsky, these are people who need to be grabbed by the collar and equated with the pavement a few times. Yeah. Now, the point is that this grassroots organization, it shows you the embryo, it shows you what working class communities are capable of, the, the, the potential down the line for, for workers' power, for workers to run their own communities, run the wider society. This grassroots self-defense, rather than criticizing it, calling for restraint, the labor movement leaders should have been backing this up. They should have been supporting it. They should be giving it structure and resources and turning this and the mobilizations we saw last night need to be turned into a mass anti-fascist campaign. That's what needs to happen, is to build upon yesterday's demonstrations, not to give ourselves a pat on the back and say, yep, yeah, brilliant, job done, threat over, now we all go back home and uh, hope for everything to go back to normal. The genie's out of the bottle here, you know, with the whole crisis, with all of these events, and you can't put it back by just uh, one mobilization. What we need to say is, yes, yesterday's victory was a, was a victory. It was a great victory. It shows the power of the working class when it's organized and mobilized, and it should give confidence to all of us. It should give confidence to every single person who was out on those demonstrations, who's been mobilizing against the far right. It should give confidence to show what is possible and it should help us give a sense, a sense of proportion as well, because that is the thing. These gangs are relatively small in reality. Their numbers are pretty tiny compared to the tens of thousands we saw out on the streets yesterday. That shows you where the real balance of class forces is in society, overwhelmingly on the side of the working class and the youth. Trotsky described uh, fascist uh, elements. He described this, this petty bourgeois kind of layer, this lump and layer. He described it as human dust, actually, that is gathered together by, the, you know, in, in, in the case of genuine mass fascist movements, gathered together and used as a battering ram against the working class, against the labor movement. But he pointed out human dust that can easily also be swept away, can be scattered into the winds by what? By the mass mobilization of the working class. And that's what you saw yesterday with these little fascist elements that have reared their ugly head, easily swept away, easily outnumbered and driven off the streets. And that's why we have to say there isn't an imminent perspective for fascism to come to power. We shouldn't overemphasize uh, this, uh, this, this risk. The social base for fascism historically, as I say, was the ruined petty bourgeoisie with uh, the lumpen elements in society, the kind of declassed elements, thrown onto the scrap heap by capitalism. But that, that, that petty bourgeois layer in particular, it's been whittled away. It's actually been driven down into the working class. What have you seen over the last decade or, or 15 years? You've actually seen that layer that would have in the past been the reserve of fascism, now coming over to the side of the working class, becoming working class itself, being drawn into the labor movement, the civil servants, the teachers, the junior doctors we've seen on strike, the barristers even, students themselves who 100 years ago would have been the ones breaking strikes and now the ones out supporting workers in action. All of that shows you the, the, the massively overwhelming strength of the working class that's getting stronger and stronger actually with, uh, with every day. And, uh, and the point is that it's only on the basis of really heavy defeats for the working class, only on the basis of defeats and re repeated uh, attempts for the working class to actually take power into their own hands and being defeated. It's only on the back of that that you would actually see the potential for reaction coming to power in the form of, of, of Bonapartism, military dictatorship, or, or, or fascism, or anything like that. That is not the, the immediate perspective. The immediate perspective is, is what is actually, yes, greater radicalization and moves in a revolutionary direction. Uh, and the working class will have many chances to take power before you see a genuine threat of Bonapartism or fascism. However, that doesn't mean we, we're complacent. It doesn't mean we, uh, we sit back and, and expect the tide of history to just uh, play itself out. There is a real fascist threat, as we've seen in recent weeks, facing Muslim communities, migrants, other minorities. 
the point we have to get across is that that will not be eradicated with appeals for calm, for peace, for love, for moderation, for unity, nor will it be uh, gotten rid of by relying on the bourgeois state. It requires clear class-based organization and mobilization. And this is important, what is missing at the moment. It needs to be linked to a bold socialist program. It needs to be linked to policies that genuinely eradicate that fertile ground of, of poverty, of deprivation, of misery, upon which the far right and demagogues like Farage thrive. Unfortunately, that is not the program and the perspective or the strategy of these reformist left and labor movement leaders. And, and this is the same limitation. These reformist limitations are the same thing we've seen playing out time and time again in Britain and internationally over the last decade and a half. You saw it with the Corbyn movement. You saw it with Enough is Enough uh, over the last few years. You saw it with the 2022-23 uh, the strike wave, uh, this, this magnificent mobilization of the junior doctors, the teachers and more. You saw it with the trade union's approach to Port Talbot and other industrial closures. What have you seen repeatedly in all of these cases is the left leaders, the so-called left leaders, failing to mobilize workers and youth, failing to take decisive militant action. And instead, in every case, calling for a reasonable, pragmatic uh, action and approach. You know, in other words, being soft and timid and actually causing demoralization, causing disorientation, causing confusion, and ultimately leading all of those struggles, leading the working class to defeat in every single case. The defeat of the Corbyn movement, the, the, the kind of dissipation of that energy around the enough is enough movement and the strike wave. Uh, and, uh, and now, yes, as I say, the closure of Port Talbot and, uh, or, the, or the blast furnaces in Port Talbot and the loss of the jobs there. Ultimately, as I say, all of these examples, they point to the, the same problem, this reformist outlook based on, on class collaboration, based on compromise, not on class struggle. You know, even uh, yesterday, we should say to the credit of the union leaders, they did call out their members in many cases. You had unions like the CWU, the RMT, the Bakers Union, calling on members to get involved in these demonstrations, to reach out to Muslim communities and help defend mosques and other, other targets. But there was nothing in those call-outs as to what next. And there is nothing in the program of these leaders as to what next, other than, as I say, to, to appeal for, for you know, uh, somehow a return to uh, a, a, a bygone age of, uh, of growth and reforms. And, uh, and in other words, with all of these people, what you see is they, they can denounce the horrors of capitalism, the racism, the war, the poverty, the exploitation, the climate catastrophe. They denounce these things. They think it's enough to denounce these things without tackling the root of the problem, which is the capitalist system itself. You know, if we want to prescribe a cure, we have to analyze and explain and identify the disease. And that means for us recognizing the significance and the essence of these events which only a Marxist perspective can provide. That's the purpose of this discussion tonight. Because what we've got to get to the root of, what we've got to understand is that all of this horror that we're seeing across the world, it is that product, as I say, of a senile, sick system in decay. There is a rejection of the bankrupt status quo. There's a collapse of the center ground in all countries. There's a profound hatred of the establishment and subsequently, that then we see, yes, a sharp polarization to the right, but also to the left, not just in Britain, but also, of course, in the USA with uh, Trump and the MAGA movement, in France with Le Pen and the national rally. But the thing is, none of these processes started just over the last month. What we've seen in recent developments is actually an amplification, I would say, of everything that we saw a, a decade ago, you know, with the uh, the same anger, if you like, finding expression in Scotland with the, uh, the, the independence movement in 2014 and subsequently with the Corbyn movement in 2015 and in the years after. And even with the vote around Brexit, they're, it all, uh, they're all symptomatic, a partial expression of that same process playing out. And we've seen it subsequently with wave after wave of protests, the climate strikes, the, the Fridays for Future, the Black Lives Matter movement. And of course, recently, we said the Palestine movement is itself, you know, that part of that same process, that same anger with, uh, you know, galvanizing around that lightning rod 
of uh, the issue of Gaza. We've seen it in clearer class terms as well, as I say, with the strike wave, the, the re-emergence of the class struggle, the, the, the working class flexing its muscles, coming back onto the scene in, uh, in the last few years. And this is where we need, as I say, a Marxist approach, because if you're a superficial, empirical sectarian, you only ever see the negative side of this process. This is what's the problem with a lot of the so-called left. They only ever see the negative. They only ever see the reactionary. We understand, however, the revolutionary implications within all of these events. Yeah, there are turbulent events taking place, oftentimes violent and barbaric, but what do they represent? They represent the old world dying and the new society trying to be born, but without the necessary revolutionary midwife to get rid of those birth pangs, if you like. We don't just see pure reaction in these events. We don't just see the threat of fascism everywhere. We understand that all events, uh, all processes, all phenomena are contradictory. We, we see things dialectically. We understand that all of these things, everything will eventually turn into its opposite. Today, all of that anger against the status quo that expresses itself through Trump, through Le Pen, through Farage, all of that anger that expresses itself in that partial distorted form in these ways, that same anger that we see today, tomorrow, will be expressed uh, if there's a revolutionary lightning rod, a revolutionary catalyst, it will be expressed in a revolutionary direction and channeled towards overthrowing capitalism. What have we seen also with yesterday's events? We've seen that yes, you've had this reaction, but Marx pointed out, sometimes the whip of counter-revolution is needed to spur on the revolution. What we're gonna see is that people uh, who've been, there, there'll be people who over the last 10 days will have been radicalized more than they have over the last 10 years, going back to what Lenin uh, said, as I quoted earlier. The problem is that there's no genuine alternative for workers and youth. There's a complete political vacuum on the left. And as long as that's the case, all manner of, of bizarre and, and reactionary uh, and confused phenomena and figures will pop up. You'll have yeah, confused, contradictory characters on the left, like George Galloway. You'll have these transitory movements, these ephemeral movements, like the student encampments popping up and then uh, disappearing again. You'll have also, yes, far-right demagogues preying on all of this, like Trump and Farage. The problem is that we are too small. That's, that's really the, the problem. As Trotsky said, the missing subjective factor, the crisis of leadership, the lack of revolutionary leadership, that is the real problem. We cannot fill this enormous vacuum. We aren't yet big enough to lead the Palestine movement. We're not big enough to organize a mass anti-fascist campaign. We're not big enough to be an electoral alternative on the left. Until we are, therefore, yeah, we will see left reformism as well coming back, appearing in various guises. We don't know exactly what that will look like just yet. We don't have a crystal ball. But what we can say is that will also be a necessary part of the process, a necessary experience. The school of reformism is something the working class as a whole will have to go through to see the limits of reformism, to see the need for revolution, to see in practice that, that these people, these reformists, cannot offer a way out of capitalism's impasse. So yeah, recent events that with this menace of the far right rearing its head again in working class communities, they should be a wake-up call to the left and the labor movement. They should be a wake-up call, a reminder of the consequences if they do not present a revolutionary alternative that can show a way forward. They should be a reminder that the future really is, as Marx and Rosa Luxemburg said, one of either a successful struggle for socialism or the barbarism of imperialist war, of racist reaction, of climate catastrophe. That is the real choice, the real alternative facing humanity. But I would add and end on this, that these events should also, they must also be a wake up call for us. They must be a jolt, a spur for us to build the only force that can cut across this Gordian knot that we see. That is of course the, the, the revolutionary leadership, the revolutionary party, the revolutionary communist party that we are trying to build. Thank you.